This is Andy Revkin. I write the Daughter Earth blog for the New York Times, and a lot of what I write about is climate change. And I'm here with today with uh, two of the authors of an important new paper in science, Pacific Ocean Heat Content During the Last Past 10,000 Years, Yair Rosenthal and Braddock Lindsley. Uh, and the other author is Delia Oppo, who's at Woods Hole. I guess you've been working for more than a decade um, in the Pacific Ocean on trying to build a record of the sort of a profile of ocean heat, um, which is not an easy thing to do. Can uh, yeah, here, can you kind of just summarize the thumbnail of the, the work, the findings? Uh, the work itself is essentially using uh, 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 fossils from the sediment trying to reconstruct the um, bottom water temperature, which means the water that interface with the sediments at different depths in the uh, Pacific Ocean, which shows Indonesia. Uh, because it's a crossroad between different uh, um, water masses traveling either from southern Pacific to the north or vice versa. So it's kind of, uh, we think it's uh, representing a larger volume than just the local volume over there. And uh, and when we did the reconstruction, and, and we were fortunate enough to find a course with high sedimentation rates, meaning that we can look at relatively fast or, or rapid changes during the uh, uh, the last 10,000 years. And by rapid, when you talk geological time scales, uh, we talk about something on the order of decades. So reconstructed uh, the last 10,000 years in relatively high resolution. And the first finding, the most conspicuous, is that uh, the temperature of the intermediate depths, we worked between our course are between about 500 meter and 1,000 meter, have shown a, a very steady and significant cooling from uh, the early Holocene to, to the present. So between 10,000 years and 8,000 years, temperature was at that point, uh, those depths is about two degrees warmer than uh, today. And then uh, the other thing, of course, the other headline is about the pace of change right now. So in other words, it seemed to me in looking at the paper that the two most significant findings were that you had um, substantial um, heat in these in the, that ocean basin. Um, hold on one second. You had substantial heat in that ocean basin, more, much more than, than now, um, early in the Holocene, closer to 10,000 years ago, but that the rate of change in, in very recent times is way off the charts in terms of rates of change you saw before. Brad, Brad can you kind of get, dive in on that a little bit, those, those two things? And yeah, so our work puts, I think, a temporal perspective on the, the modern instrumental data that you referred to that has been published by many people looking at the temperature or heat content of the ocean over the last 60 years based on instrumental thermometer data from ships and buoys. And that shows a pretty rapid rate of warming of the upper 1,000 meters of the water column. But, um, and that rate uh, is quite a bit higher than the rate of change we've seen in the last 10,000 years at any point. So we have this long-term cooling trend that reversed sometime in the Little Ice Age. And then there's been this quite rapid now warming in the instrumental data, in which in that warming uh, appears to correspond to the warming in the you know the surface of the surface of the planet. Now, how, how, could you have high level confidence in being able to uh, rule out that there were periods of uh, rapid change of that sort in in the proxies that you're looking at in the sediments and stuff? So these are also these are fossils extracted from sediments that have been bioturbated. We have pretty high accumulation rates, but we don't have annual resolution. We, I mean, we would say we probably have century scale resolution at, at best. And so it's possible that um, the sediments just didn't record similar warmings in the past. Is that true, Yair? Would you agree with that? Yeah, Andy, I, I would like to, to suggest, because people will make the analogy to uh, surface reconstruction, the deep ocean tends to average and, and smooth the records. So you're not affected by seasonal or, or interannual variability. So I think it's fair to say that it's unlikely 
that very rapid changes on the order of, let's say, uh, years to even decades appear in the record. I mean, it's noisy a little bit, but that's the quality of the recorder that we are using. Um, but we have, it's, it's a big caveat when you compare instrumental records with, with the fossil records, and, and, and I think qualitatively, I think we can uh, uh, see that starting at 1600, Little Ice Age, the warming of the intermediate depths is fairly slow. When you compare it to the so-called hockey stick, not the original one, but anything that has been done by different group, including ourselves, you know, the surface recover almost to or, or maybe over the medieval warm period. The deep ocean did not. So it's only the recent warming that is really, really fast. Um, Go ahead. Because uh, this has come up before, Shakun, uh, Jeremy, I did a similar video chat with uh, Jeremy Shakun um, earlier this year in a paper that was right. had a sim different kinds of analyses, but the same conclusion of looking at instrumental change, measured change in that the recent surface, period. Surface temperatures. Right, compared to a longer record from um, proxies. And, and the, the ch you know, what you always get here as well, you're comparing uh, apples to oranges in some, to some extent. How, how do you know back in the, that record that you don't have similar um, fluctuations on those small time scales? That, that's one question. And again, the paper, the, one of the lines in, in the opening of your paper is the modern rate of Pacific Ocean heat content change is the highest in the past 10,000 years, period. And I just want to be sure I understand what's the basis for that conclusion. Uh, so, so two things. I think we have to. Uh, uh, since you measure, uh, you mentioned uh, the Shakun study, the market study. Uh, if you compare, our, our records really complemented in the sense that when you compare the two records, it's pretty striking that uh, the surface temperature were relatively steady over the last ten thousand years, whereas the deep ocean has been changing much more. So I think that's that's big news. Uh, that's a surprising result. Yeah, and and if you look, uh, our temperature kind of more consistent with their high uh, northern hemisphere or high latitude temperature, suggesting that the deep ocean, which communicates with the atmosphere at the high latitude, may be taking a, a heat in a faster rate or more efficient than we assumed before. Um, so I think this comparison is is important, and the situation now is reverse. Now the surface is 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 acting much faster than the intermediate water. So we are not in the natural normal situation where the atmosphere and the ocean are in equilibrium, let's say on century or more time scales. So I think. It's fair to say, uh, although I don't think we can prove it with the current data right now without doubt, that the rate of warming of the deep ocean is, is much higher than what we see. Now, we have to be careful. It cooled almost 10,000 years, so the warming that we see actually is since the little ice age. And I think the ocean yeah. is recovering, but the pace is not, you know, with, with the caveat that, you know, our thermometers are not as accurate as the modern one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Brad, it, could it you... It may, uh, may take several decades or a century even for the ocean to equilibrate for this new situation and the heat budget. Um, and this gets... Well, I actually, want, Brad, I want to ask you a couple things. One is a, uh, you mentioned the most surprising that this was a surprise. Can you can you kind of just go through a couple of uh, whatever about this finding that you see as the biggest surprises? One thing that was interesting to me was it seems to reinforce um, the global nature of some of the last past early Holocene fluctuations where there had been some debate about whether those were regional small-scale things or global. What what about the, the work that you've done adds to the picture of those having a real global um, feel? So, you know, this work started in 2003 when we collected these cores, and our first series of papers we published were on the surface ocean record. Dalia Opo was a cup for us to author in a nature paper just to touch, talking about the medieval warm period, where we found warmer temperatures in the, in the western Pacific warm pool, where this, these cores were from. They're the largest massive 
of surface warm water on the planet, and those temperature records really mirrored what's going on in the northern hemisphere. And then I was first author on a paper in Nature Geoscience talking about the, the last, the whole Holocene record of the surface ocean, which showed that temperatures peaked in the early Holocene, we call the Holocene Thermal Maximum, between roughly 10 and uh, 8,000 years ago, and their temperatures were about half a degree of centigrade warmer than today, and it was in this long-term cooling. And then both those surface records, though, on different time scales showed this medieval warm period, which had been thought to be simply a northern hemisphere European thing, and it's clearly showing up in the surface ocean. And now our deep cores, and the intermediate depth cores, are showing the same um, medieval warm period effect um, and the you know it's a thousand meters down, and wow. so it's clearly showing that these these events in the little ice age as well, which is just half a meter of a warm period, these events are global, and so I think that's a pretty surprising uh, result from this work. Have you do you, do either of you get into the modeling much, and or I mean, how much does this sort of force a kind of reconsideration of existing models of how the system, the ocean atmosphere system, is uh, is set up? It, it seems like. To me, in looking at this, it kind of says, "Whoa, things are <laughs> more." I mean, it's things are more interconnected, I think, than we thought. We can't think of this as a, just these European events or northern right. hemisphere events. They were in the were in the middle of the warm pool in the Western Pacific, on the equator, and south of the equator, and still we're seeing these these century scale events: um, the medieval warm period, and the Little Ice Age, this Holocene thermal maximum ten thousand years ago, also was thought to be simply northern hemisphere at first. Um, so I think these these events are global, and um, we would expect other events to be as well. I think it's fascinating, uh, Yair or Brad. What does that say about next steps in terms of looking at the overall picture of um, uh, refining models uh, and or refining a sense of where we're headed um, in coming decades, if not centuries? Well, I hate this is not what I make my living of models, so I have to be careful. And I, I, I think you got more attention than I am from the modeler over the last 24 hours. But if I may uh, uh, make some guesses, uh, we see two things, and I think you you highlighted them in your email. One is that yes, we have a very rapid, uh, uh, if it's true, uh, rapid warming now relative. Mm -hmm what we had before, suggesting that the ocean is is taking heat, but also is uh, reflecting the global warming. But to me, when I look at this deep, uh, the fact that uh, 300 years ago, the ocean heat content was so low, um, and I use the word capacitor in the paper, meaning that we can charge it a lot without maybe or, or buffering what happened in the atmosphere. This is under equilibrium. This works both ways, uh, warming, but also uh, if we go back to what it seems now completely past gun, you know, whether we put some uh, uh, cap on emissions, you know, the idea was that the ocean will excel heat and basically warm the atmosphere. So my, this is a policy and I'm not, you know, my thinking is, well, if I were to make a decision and someone say, um, you know, cap the emission and, and then wait 100 or 150 years, why would I do it now? Um, maybe the ocean is taking the heat more and won't excel it as much. So that's what I, the challenge that I have for the, 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 the modeler. And I think that's what you had in mind, actually, uh, when you asked those two questions. And uh, Brad, what are, you know, what's your reaction? Does this mean... Um if this holds up in as robust sense that there's essentially more capacity for the ocean to take to build heat and maybe not expel it quickly is this basically are we going to luck out here in terms of maybe having that be a better um, system to work with and trying to figure out how to get our missions in order well I think this shows we need to focus some more attention on the the places in the northern and southern hemispheres where these, this, the deep ocean is talking to the atmosphere and absorbing this heat. And I think we um, need to spend some more time to understand how that water makes its way towards the equator. I mean, we're essentially, I think, in my view, running a large experiment where we're putting this heat into the ocean, deep ocean. And we don't quite know what the downstream effects are going to be. Uh, there could be positive effects, buffering effects, but could be some pretty big negative effects. We don't really know. There's a lot of uncertainty in my view. Although, in a way, doesn't the early Holocene provide a, at least a hint of what 
that might look like in the sense that when you look back, you, you have a heck of a lot more heat in the oceans then than you do now. Yeah, our results would suggest that there was more heat in the ocean in the early Holocene, though it took it, it absorbed that heat much more slowly than it is now. There's much more rapid changes going on. So as Ravel said in 1958 with Seuss, uh, we are conducting the experiment. Um, uh, but a lot of people are at least trying to figure out, as you guys are, um, ways to get a handle on, to bound what might be might, might, what might be happening. Um, do you already uh, do you already have a sense of how this is stirring the pot with your colleagues and other as other parts of this big thing called climate global warming research? It's such a variegated system, the science system. You have climatologists and glaciologists and oceanographers and modelers and um, who is this most likely to challenge amid all of that? And then who is most likely to see this as really helping uh, cement an argument in one way or the other? I'll let you take that one. <laughs> well, I hope uh, 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 the models will pick up on that. I mean, we are we are doing the data uh, uh, the records, and clearly one caveat, uh, which would be interesting, is that we are looking at one part of the ocean. We think that this part is uh, as representative as it can be, but uh, we need, uh, uh, I hate to say that every scientist say, but we need more data, and that's right. what we're doing this way, yeah. But, so it could be that other parts of the ocean have cooled. I don't believe, and we have some data to show that it's not, but even if it is, then the ocean is redistributing uh, uh, um, heat in a, in a different way. So. The, the ARMA system, the, 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 the modern observation, you know, within years will give us more information. Uh, we, the, the, the ocean-going people, hopefully will, you know, try to validate it. But I would like to hear from the uh, physical oceanographer and the modeler how that, you know, interpret into model prediction of future or past. Hopefully it has some implication to policies. What's I mean, you're not a policy person, but right away, what's the in that arena? What do you see as the biggest sort of take-home point here? Um, you know, I don't know. I can guess. I mean, if yeah. the law, if if indeed part of what we see um, now is largely human activity, but also some recovery from the the low, natural low, low temperature, low ocean, ocean heat content during the Little Ice Age, I would think that right now the highest rates, you know, can temporarily alleviate some of the warming, maybe for decades or, or more. So we may want to think about what the future will be once we got. I mean, what you see at face value is a medieval warm period, the ocean heat content you know, within the, 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 the uncertainties that we have, might have been much higher, yet the temperature were not much higher than today. So, but this is a different world. It's a natural equilibrium world. We are pumping now very fast. The ocean is not capable to keep up with on this time scale. So yeah. I think it alleviates it on my life and your life time scale. Yeah. So, uh, Brad, Brad, I want to ask you, and actually both of you, but I'll start with Brad. Um, hold on a second. Um, years ago, I did a post um, musing on whether we, we made a mistake just in calling this global warming instead of calling it global heating. Yeah. In other words, it's heat that the, the indisputable, indisputable reality is that there's a lot of heat in, coming into the system. Um, um, would that have been? There was actually a guy at another university who set up a website called globalheating.org. It's defunct right now, I think. But, but, it, but is that more? Is that a better way to look at the problem? Well, that's something new about what we did in the studies. We tried to estimate, you know, the ocean heat content used from temperature data. And one of the main uncertainties of doing that is it turns out some of the and Ayer can talk more about this, but the volume calculation, the volume estimates for the, how much volume is in the ocean is actually, there's a big error bar on that. And so trying to turn temperature, proxy temperature data into heat was, is, uh, it's, it's complicated. It's not that simple of a calculation. It's much easier to measure temperature with thermometers or paleo thermometers. Yeah, Eric, you can chime in. I like global heating, and that's where I, I wish that, because I think, uh, um, 
you know, we have to do, and people have been dealing, it's not we invented it, with essentially the perturbation to the energy budget of the planet, which is heat. So temperature are important, but, you know, when you melt ice, for example, it's the heat. I mean, you don't change the temperature, you can change a lot, right. melt a lot of ice. So, and I think, you know, uh, when I think about ocean heat content and our results, I can take it back uh, uh, in times. And there is a lot of focus, of, for example, on the mid Pliocene. And people say, why? It was only a few degrees, a couple of degrees uh, warmer than today. Uh, and, and, and what was the sea level? I think it's the heat that is going to uh, to be the main player. So I think, I mean, I'm with you. I, uh, you know, the protagonist should be heat, not uh, just uh, temperature. I I wanted to wrap up with that 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 key point that you guys that you actually Yair made, um, which is that the oceans are clearly, according to your work, um, the, the the heat content is rising rapidly right now. But it's from a very essentially from a very low um, baseline, at least mm. compared to the Holocene overall. And um, it's kind of like there's a lot of room in the bank essentially to make more deposits. Is is that <laughs> what we're looking at here? I would hope so that this is the case, right? That that's that is my hope, but it may it may not be helping us in terms of the current changes in the atmosphere as much. Wait, could you just get at that again? I want to be sure I understand what you just said. You may well, not the atmosphere is now responding very quickly, right? Uh, because it doesn't have any heat capacity, and the ocean right. is lagging it. So. Even if the ocean takes more efficient heat than, than we assume, it may not help you and I in terms of, you know, the global heating or warming, whatever you call it. But I think it's worthwhile trying to put it into some numbers or models, which we haven't had a chance right now of doing it. Yeah. But I think, yes, I think uh, there is a deficiency based on this record to the extent that it represents the ocean. There is a deficiency of heat that the ocean can take and hopefully, you know, given enough time, uh, buffer some of the atmospheric changes. Hmm. But it won't happen back. unless we reduce the, 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 the rate of heating of the atmosphere. Go ahead. Brad. Brad? And Andy, back to your point about modeling, I think that's something the modelers could be looking more at. What, what will be the effects of this heat going into the ocean? Because um, we don't know, and that's where as I said, I think we're running this experiment, and we should would like to know more about what the potential outcomes will be, given the consequences potentially. Sure. And 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 over the long haul, um, as David Archer and others have shown, you know, we're talking about as the system equilibrates in a very long way. We're talking about a very long thaw. Um, that's see, that's still pretty much. Uh, I can't see any arguments that stand up against that idea. I think at the end, the oceans, our understanding that the ocean on, on, on long time scales are in equilibrium with the atmosphere. The question is where? And I mentioned the Pliocene. You know, I, I don't have the data, but I think the ocean probably heat content was very, very high. Yet the temperature were two, three degrees only. But they, we know some <coughs> records now showing huge. Uh, warming. So yeah, the lo we we should look at the short and long term, you know, effects. Those are the implications. Though I I would rethink them. Yeah. Uh, Brad, any capping thoughts? Oh, well, we should point out the Pliocene is two to three or four million years ago, and that, you know, and so the audience knows that. I think, this, I think this work needs to be replicated in other core sites, um, particularly in the Atlantic, in Indian Oceans. That, um, and I should say that you can't just do this kind of work anywhere. You need sediments that accumulate rapidly, so you have more samples per time, and you're able to make these measurements. So we actually me measured a very particular type of organism called a, a benthic foraminifera, a very particular species, and that doesn't exist everywhere, so we need to look for places it does. Um, and I think the more uh, down core records like that, the better, and we can get a better idea of uh, you know, the different effect across all ocean basins. And that would be a good next step. Are there, um, I assume there's ways to kind of uh, figure out, just based on topography and circulation, what spots are the best likely to have that kind of 
uh, record? I mean, is this already understood, or like where, or not? Well, oh, in this case, we targeted uh, core sites near land masses because that's where the, a lot of the sediments come from, and it pumps up the sedimentation rate, so you get more sediments per time. In the middle of the deep ocean, sediments accumulate around two centimeters per thousand years. Where on our sites, if you look in the paper, they're between 50 and 150 centimeters per thousand wow. years, so much more rapid accumulations. But we can target other sites in the Atlantic or Indian Oceans that are in similar situations that get the same exact water depths. So we can definitely target them and look. Okay. Hey. Can I add one? Yeah, yeah, sure. You need the perfect storm, which means you need to have the right place where you look for the changes oceanographically, like uh, different water plant masses. You need the um, the place, as, as, as uh, uh, Brad mentioned, that the sediment accumulating very, very, very fast so you can get good records, and you need the political uh, uh, um, permission. This work was done in Indonesia, and we were lucky. I don't think we can do it today for reasons that I don't. So uh, from from your side, you know, we would like to work in those places. I just got back from Papua New Guinea, but there are other places, but some... I would say silly geopolitical <laughs> barriers are keeping us, but we thank the Indonesian and fund, for funding barriers too. Yeah, yeah. Funding barriers too. Yeah, is this is this work that kind of is hard to get? Um, no, actually, uh, it was done in the early 2000s, and I have to say, I don't know if today atmosphere it would be funded. It was very risky yeah. because we had to rebuild uh, a lot of the coring on Indonesian ship, but NSF, I give it. You know all the credits for for saying, "Hey, go there. This is great. Try to do that." Yeah, um, this work was funded by the National Science Foundation, and I think their budgets are under some stress right now. So, but this kind of work, I think, should be funded, and you know, argue that it should be. Well, it certainly feels highly relevant considering how how many um, uh, arenas it's related to, from policy to um, figuring out ways to improve the models. Um, uh, I can't think of work that would be much more important than this. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, this will be uh, valuable, hopefully, for Dot Earth readers and beyond, and good luck with your next steps in your work.